I didn't know it done so many things until you hear it read, read out like that. I guess that's the curse of living a long time. You keep doing things and, and they keep piling up. Um, I have one correction though, I, and this is a very important one. I was not born in North Carolina. I was born in Texas. My dad was a Marine brat. I moved here when I was seven and uh, we went to the beach uh, from Havelock to Salter Path because that's where the road ended. And when I moved back and I uh, was 12, we moved back and we were in Swansboro and then Cape Carteret. But at that time, everybody on that side of Broad Creek went to Swansboro High School and Carteret County just paid us to go there because it was cheaper. Uh, so I want to correct that. That's a real important thing to most North Carolinians. Were you born there? Somebody accused me of trying to mislead you. And uh, being a politician, I'm not going to mis mislead you about that. Everybody remembers the flack John Edwards took for some of the things he said during the campaign about where he was from. <clears throat> now, um, you heard of what I had done beforehand, but, but let me kind of set the stage for what happened leading up to Sea of Greed. In 1976, Jimmy Carter was elected President of the United States, and in 1977 he presented his first budget and he cut the federal law enforcement budget by 15% across the board. Uh, what that had as a practical effect, it meant that the customs boats weren't going out when somebody in a law enforcement agency retired, that position was not filled. Um, when I took over the U.S. Attorney's Office as the first assistant in September of 1981, shortly after President Reagan had won, um, and the hiring freeze was lifted, <coughs> we had five assistant U.S. Attorneys for the 44 counties of eastern North Carolina, and all that we have, Fort Bragg, Camp Lejeune, and all the national seashores and national uh, properties, federal properties that we have. And, had two of those were prosecutors and three were handling civil matters. Uh, so we were very, very understaffed and that was throughout all law enforcement on the, on the federal level at that time. Uh, also, at the same time, we had just been through the Vietnam War era and people in the anti-war movement had accumulated a huge taste for marijuana. Uh, any anti-war rally you went to, that was what you smelled was marijuana smoke and the standard that they wanted was Colombian gold. There was uh, marijuana that was grown in Colombia. It was supposed to be the best and people would pay premium prices for it. So smugglers looked around and they said, hey, the cop on the beach numbers, uh, the penalties for running grass in are not real high. The coast of North Carolina was relatively undeveloped at that point uh, as it is compared to today. There were big swaths of the intercoastal waterway that were uh, still forested in places where you could have clandestine offload sites uh, that were near roads. So it w and then at first the smugglers were coming just into Florida and the Gulf Coast, but later they kept looking for other sites that weren't quite as hot and had as much law enforcement um, activity. And that's how North Carolina got to be um, attractive. Now, the, the story in my book and the way this story begins, it really begins with the Lady Marset. And the Lady Marset was a sh typical coastal shrimper, as you see. It had IBM on the stern, which is not where it was from at all. The Lady Marset was the real name, and she was from Louisiana, uh, down in the Cajun country, where she had been leased by the people who were behind it. On July the 2nd, 1982, it was July the 4th weekend, and two Coast Guardsmen on routine patrol from Atlantic Beach Station in one of those rubber rigid inflatables went out from the station and they were mainly going to go look and see if those sailboat people had unrafted from their floating cocktail party and had gone to mooring and, and left the, the channel open. And as they cleared the, the station, they looked out to Beaufort Inland, looked to the sea and they saw two lights way, way, way out. But they knew that those were, they were heading to run aground on that, their current course. So they turned to lend assistance. Then the first boat came back in the channel and then was followed by the second boat and all they could see was the lights. So as they got closer and the first boat came in by Taylor's Creek, they realized something is up here because this was like a Carolina skiff type vessel, but it had five guys in it and one of them very, definitely stood out. He, he was Colombian. Uh, well, they knew him as Hispanic, but he was, turns out he was Colombian. Uh, he was swarthy, he had his long hair. Now remember the 80s and disco fever. He had flared bell-bottom pants, stacked heel shoes, a uh, shirt that was open to the, to the navel, gold chains were draped around his 
chest, and they said, this is not somebody we usually see on, uh, on, in Carteret County waters. You know, this is not a bo normal Beaufort Inlet person or, or the uh, Bogue Sound. So they followed them into Taylor's Creek and had some interaction with them and realized they were lying to them. One of the Coast Guardsmen realized that as they came up on, on them, something went over the side and he triangulated where he was. The next day, a Beaufort Police Department diver went down and found all of their IDs and a 357 Magnum pistol. But that was the next day. While they were there, this vessel churned past the Coast Guardsmen and just kept going. And so they wanted to go find that boat. And so they left these guys, went looking for the Lady, uh, the Lady Marset, but the Bobby M as, as it has on the name of it, and found it at the fuel docks in Moorhead City. One of the Coast Guardsmen's name Other mate, Richard Hall, uh, where he shouldn't be. Now, the Coast Guard is not as professional back then as they are today. If any of you come down to the, to the coast and you see the, the Coast Guard law enforcement people on patrol today, you know, they have the machine gun mounted on the front of the rubber, the rubber ref inflatable. They've got four people usually. They're vested. They have M16s and they have their 9 millimeters. They had that night, they had each a 45 pistol unloaded with two magazines. So they were not prepared for what they were dealing with that particular time. He got on the vessel and he looked and he saw a chart with a track line coming all the way from Columbia and ending up in Atlantic Beach and Beaufort Inlet. It had points along the way. And then he saw a single sideband radio, which is not customary on coastal shrimpers, way more radio communication ability than they needed. So he asked if the hole was empty, and he said, sure, you want to look at it? And he said, yes, and that's when he heard a shotgun rack around. And if you've ever heard a pump shotgun make that sound, you'll, forgive, you'll never forget it. And he heard that, and he talked his way off the boat, and they didn't shoot him, fortunately. He got with Hall, and they went down the waterfront, down near the sanitary where there were some telephones because they knew they couldn't call on their radio or they would hear the transmission. No encrypted radio equipment back then. Uh, didn't have cell phones. So they had to look for that old-fashioned payphone and drop, dropped a quarter in the slot, dialed the station for assistance, and eventually law enforcement came and found the, uh, crawled over the boat, and we found 29,000 pounds of marijuana. Now, the, the investigation began at, at that point. I was assigned to uh, lead the investigation. We had a lot of investigative agencies involved, and they did a lot of investigation that actually produced results later on when we had some witnesses. They found places at Emerald Isle uh, and in various uh, motels where people had rented rooms or rented beach houses, uh, suspicious circumstances. We found a boat that was abandoned at the Emerald Isle Marina by the Emerald Isle Police. Uh, they had just been left there you know, and uh, that they had used in, the, in their things. So we had a lot of information that something wasn't right. They, these were here, but uh, we really couldn't put any of it together. So the people who were in charge, there were three, Stephen Kalish, one was named, uh, he was from Houston, Texas and a high school dropout. One was named uh, Lee Rich, he was the Grand Cayman playboy and he had the connections to the Colombian gold marijuana that they were importing, and a guy named Michael Vogel who had customers up in Detroit. This guy, he was one of the persons who had invested money, given them startup money as a loan for them to pay for those expenses that they needed to up front, and he had loaned them $100,000, and he lost it on that first load, so they came back to him and borrowed another 100, and eventually they paid him back 300, so he loaned two and got 100 in, in profit. Uh, Doc McGee managed Bon Jovi and Motley Crue, and when I prosecuted him, that's what that's what was his occupation. He now manages Gene Simmons or Kiss today. So, having a uh, uh, drug smuggling conviction just gives you street creds in Hollywood, I guess. <laughs> and you may have seen him because uh, Gene Simmons had a TV show called The Family Jewels that was on the A and E channel, and he would do uh, sort of cameos. There's a picture of Kalish and Rich. Um, who were the, the main people. Well, they had a meeting in Detroit at, at Vogel's house, and they said that could not happen again. That, just could, that was just a fluke, the Coast Guard coming out at that particular time. And the only thing that they had planned wrong 
uh, in their whole planting scheme was they came in right at the beginning of shrimp season in July. And Marine Fisheries was boarding every shrimper to make sure they had paid their tax stamps and the <laughs> revenue thing. And so that's why they were trying to run it in at night. So they decided to come back in later on with another vessel, which they also named the Bobby M when they, <laughs> they liked that name, but we didn't catch that boat. And they came in successfully in November and did a 39,000 pound load successfully in Carteret County and offloaded it in the Back Creek area where they had a clandestine, um, kind of like a, a, a place where you couldn't be seen from the water, but it was deep up near the shoreline, particularly at, that, at, at this time. And we've actually found that location and been there. And you can't see the water. And even today, it's still about 12 feet deep, as close as I am to the second, the second uh, uh, row of seats here. So it's very close to get to the shore. And the way they unloaded the boat is they would just use a, a conveyor belt like you would have in a factory and put the boxes on the conveyor and slide it down. And they would slide the, the uh, marijuana off the, the, the bail chunkers or bail humpers, they would have to take that and, and hike it over to the truck, which was about 75 yards away. So he, the, the people who worked the hardest got paid the least, and, and, uh, but they're the ones who kind of made that work. Well, the smuggling continued. That's kind of like what the waterway looked like in, at that particular time. When we took that shot, it looks very clandestine, but on the right-hand side of the channel, Today, there's a lot of beach houses that have been built, waterfront properties, so you couldn't smuggle in that area today. But that's kind of what it, what it looked like back in the time. Well, that was the last, that one load that was seized was the last load this group lost to law enforcement. They had the 1,000 pounds. They had a number of airplane loads that were landing in clandestine airstrips in Kentucky and the upper Michigan Peninsula and um, about 10,000 pounds each, and they did a big load up the Mississippi River of over 600,000 pounds on an ocean-going barge. And um, when that barge was discovered on a, sun, on a Monday morning at a steel plant in Lafayette, Louisiana, uh, they said, anybody think that we're supposed to have a delivery here? We've got a barge out back. Said, no, no, no barge. They went on board and found 20,000 pounds of marijuana that was wet in the scuppers that they had left and they had 580,000 pounds they took to Detroit and sold. So they, Kalish himself, ended up with $50 million in cash in a house in Tampa, Florida under shotgun guard with naked Cuban women doing the counting. And, and that was a true story. Um, and um, he, we found, we executed a search warrant after they had moved that money and found two money counters like they use at banks or in Vegas casinos, and they were burned out. Uh, from all the money that they had run through those machines. And um, this obviously created a problem because Kalish could not keep that forever in that house. Um, and another thing about the house, you had to wear a mask in there. The house was so small and the money was stacked. Uh, money in those closed quarters, because of the chemicals that are in some of the money, it becomes a little toxic. And so you have to be very careful ar around that money. He needed a place to put it. And he found a Cuban in Miami who introduced him to Manuel Noriega in Panama. And his first meeting with Noriega, he bribed him with $300,000 in cash. And Noriega said, Mr. Kalish, uh, you can come to Panama and do business, and I'll only take 5% of all the money for, my, for myself, and you can put it in Panamanian banks. And it became very easy for him to um, get that money out, because now he just took it to his private jet airplane, he put it on the jet and duffel bags, flew it over to the, uh, Panama. They went over to the military side of the airport where DEA could not run surveillance on the aircraft, and they had a uh, military police escort all the way to the bank. And he set it up in dummy corporations and, and things of that nature and got to be quite, uh, quite good friends with Noriega. In fact, Noriega uh, was a person who, in this we like this. He was a man who could not be bought, but he could be rented from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> and the American government was paying the rent. And Noriega was actually giving awards for, quote, cooperating in the, um, the war on drugs. So he uh, had been flown back to Washington in Kalish's Learjet to go get an award from President Reagan and provide information to the CIA about Castro. Uh, 
and so he got an award from DEA. He cooperated with CIA. CIA gave him money while Kalish was paying him and flying him around. Uh, and Kalish uh, had become quite close to him in uh, Panama at this point and had actually bought some property down there. After he left uh, in, the, in the Learjet, they actually went to my wife's hometown of Las Vegas. That's why this slide is here. And they, uh, Noriega and Kalish went partying with showgirls for about a week before he headed back to uh, Panama. And uh, somehow our intelligence agencies didn't know any of this. I don't know. Uh, seems like they know everything, but they don't know anything. So uh, at this point, now I want to bring you a little bit up to date of what, what had Kalish been doing. Well, Kalish... And then I think you'll find this interesting. How did he come to North Carolina? Kalish is from Houston, Texas. He was smuggling into the Gulf Coast. Uh, he ended up with a house in, in Tampa, which he was under shotgun guard and uh, with all that money. Uh, how does a guy like that find Beaufort Inlet? Well, what happened was Kalish was a bit of a, a party animal. He was 32 years old at that time more or less, and he was in a bar in Atlanta. He, he left the Gulf Coast. He had had a, sea, a load seized down there by their task force, and he said he, to his folks down there that he was going to go find another spot. Well, he was just banging around the countryside. He was in a bar in Atlanta, and he sees a pretty girl. He tells the maitre d' take her a bottle of champagne. Uh, see another pretty girl. He'd have to take a bottle of champagne over to her. He had a roll of hundreds, he would choke a horse, he was wearing gold chains and that same kind of uh, 1980s uh, dress that was common in the discos and everything. And there was a guy from Beaufort, North Carolina in there, a young guy about his age, just started a restaurant in downtown Beaufort, uh, it was called the Net House. It stayed there for 20 some years because after the Lady Marset was fled, uh, was, was caught, he fled and his sister and her husband had to come down from Baltimore and operate it, which they did for 20-some years. It's now been sold, and it's called the Salt Life. And so it, the, the building is still a restaurant and still right there. Well, he was in there, and he saw Kalish doing all this and playing the role. And so he went over to him and just said, hey, I don't know if you're in the import-export business or not, but if you are, I know a place where you might want to be interested. And, uh, of course, Kalish thought, is this a cop or who he was? And they felt each other out, but eventually... He began to trust him, and he came to North Carolina and saw that there was a place where the waterway was totally undeveloped. The cops were really, really no threat, rinky-dink. He always came in with his crew to an offload site, and they would spend about two weeks surveilling all law enforcement in the community, listening to them on the radio, figuring out what their typical patrol patterns were for the highway patrol, the sheriff's department, the local police, the Coast Guard, any kind of marine patrols they might be running. And his guys would go out fishing every day and fishing, at, even go out at night uh, on the water and fish and, and do the surveillance. And so uh, Kalish, at, at that point, came to North Carolina. Now shortly after that, Kalish was in a, another nightclub and he met a young lady whose name was Denise, whose father was a Secret Service agent, and he did this send the bottle of champagne over routine that he found so uh, easy to meet young ladies. And he talked to her and he said, do you want to go to the Grand Caymans in my jet? And she said, sure. Like, this guy really has a jet, you know. He sent me a bottle of champagne, he thinks I'm going to fall for that. So he went and made a phone call, got his plane ready, and they left a Tampa nightclub that they were at. He went to his airplane and there the, the crew was waiting. They whisked him on the plane with her and one of her girlfriends, and they flew to the Grand Caymans. Now she was impressed, and she wondered what he did, and he told her he was an international banker. And that was kind of true, but not, uh, <laughs> you know, that's not where the money came from, but he was banking that money internationally, so it was only a, a half line. Well, so several years now have gone by. I had this case in like 1982, and I haven't heard anything about it for a long period of time. And uh, when that load went up the Mississippi River, we call it Sea of Greed, the book, because it's waterborne smuggling, and greed tore them apart. Well, what happened was the guy in Detroit, Vogel, who had the customers, he had a load coming in that was his on an airplane about the same time that this load was coming up the, the river on the Mississippi River. And he wanted his airplane to reach there before the marijuana came in on the barge 
because he knew that 580,000 pounds of marijuana is going to depress the price. Mind you, he wasn't going to lose money on his deal. He just wasn't going to make as much on the 10,000 pounds that were all his that he didn't have to share. And he held one of his subalterns, uh, a guy whose name was Clinton Anderson, or we nicknamed Shine, and so I'll just call him Shine for the rest of the talk. He held him responsible. He said, Shine, keep the barge back. He said, I can't keep the barge back. The barge is on its way, man. Well, I've got this plane, but they're only up now, and they're gonna, they won't get here until two or three days from now. And he said, the barge is going to be in. I can't stop it. Well, this festered with Vogel. After it was over and everything, he still held Shine accountable. And so one day after he was drinking and just really ticked at Shine, he had one of his other lieutenants, a guy named Larry Garcia, he said, go shoot Shine, and you've, you've got his job as head of security. Garcia goes over to Anderson's house, and Shine was drunk, and he had a drinking problem too. And uh, he was drunk, and he went to the door, and Larry Garcia said, Shine, this is from Vogel. And he had a 12-gauge, and he went up against the back wall, and I thought he was dead. But God protects drunks, and he didn't feel it the same way you and I would because of the alcohol in his system, and so the pain didn't put him down. He crawled to the phone, and if you ever want to get saved by 911 people, the EMS, do it in Detroit because they saved his life. And he's in the hospital, and he meets this, well, let's see. Go back one. I'm off kilter with my wife's running the, the slides. He met this man who was an FBI agent named Ned Timmons, and Ned gave him a choice. He said, Shine, you want to take your chances on the street? Your brothers have told me what you're in. His brothers were informants uh, on union racketeering and motorcycle gangs and for the FBI, and they had told him what Shine was into, and he said, you can either be an immunized witness with us, or when you heal up, go back out on the street and see if uh, they shoot straighter the next time. So Shine introduced Timmons as an undercover agent into this organization and told us all about it. Now we had the witness that we needed to knit the case together and to start being able to think about prosecuting folks. And um, Timmons went undercover into the Grand Cayman Islands and corroborated everything that Shine had been taking and even took him into where Lee Rich had his compound and he was able to uh, converse with Lee, corroborate everything that he was hap that was happening. Um, Kalish, in the meantime, had come back to the United States. He had to, um, you can go forward now. <laughs> We're a little bit out of sync, but we've done this a few times. Um, Kalish had gone back to the United States. He had records on a computer. He was really one of the early people to use computer. He had his payroll. He had his profits and losses and all of the kind of financial records that any business keeps. And drug dealers are no different than any other business. They have to keep records of what they do. They can't keep it all in their head, particularly when it's billions of dollars and uh, in this case, I prosecuted over 125 people that were on his payroll. So Kalish said, I'm going to get this. Told Denise, I'm going to get this. I'm going to never going back to this again. Well, he came into one of the... Timmons was in the Grand Caymans and knew where Kalish was. And at this point, Kalish had been out on appeal bond from a case in Texas that he had, and he was a fugitive because he hadn't surrendered when he was supposed to and there was an open warrant of arrest for him, so the FBI went looking for him and found him at the airport where his uh, private aircraft was, was uh, housed and were able to arrest him. And then shortly after that, we were able to arrest Lee Rich. Uh, Lee Rich was going to leave the Grand Caymans. Timmons was there and found out about it, and he was going to go to the wedding of Heather Locklear and Tommy Lee, in Jamaica. And so we were able to notify the Jamaicans and say, we want this guy to be arrested and declared persona non grata when he arrives in Jamaica. And they said, let me get this straight, Mon. All we got to do is take this white boy uh, from the Grand Caymans and put him on an airplane to New York. Said, That's all you got to do. And they said, we can do that. We don't have to go down to the neighborhood and shoot it out with a posse or something like that. And uh, so we got Lee Rich. He came in with his date for this uh, Hollywood wedding. and. His date was Miss Columbia from the Miss Universe contest, 
and I'm sure she didn't go unescorted for the weekend, but she didn't go with Lee. And uh, he came off the plane and on an angrata, Mr. Rich, uh, we're going to take you and put you on out of this airport. And he said, no, I want to go back on that plane and go back home. And they said, no, 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 this plane is under customs quarantine and can't leave for two weeks. And so they took him to a commercial plane, and that just happened to be going to New York, and that's how we got hold of him. And then we, of course, arrested um, the other man, uh, Vogel, in Detroit. He hadn't gone anywhere, and we were able to get them. And we started an indictment process. Well, during, during this process, we had a very curious situation. Tampa wanted to prosecute some of the ringleaders, Rich, Vogel, and Kalish, and just a few others. And then I had a whole host of people that I wanted to prosecute who had been involved in the two smuggling cases that came into eastern North Carolina. And so we had, uh, you've seen TV shows, and they'll have the feds and the state people arguing and fussing with each other and having the turf war. Well, we had a fed-on-fed fed turf war. And Tampa thought, I got off the turnip truck yesterday because I'm from eastern North Carolina. I'm a, you know, uh, at, at that time, Andy Griffith was still on the, on the uh, TV, and so you had that image that you had to overcome. And I, it was kind of hard to overcome that image when your Coast Guard guys are going around with unloaded uh, pistols. So <laughs> kind of played into the, to the, mental, the mental picture. Tamp and I had a battle. We finally resolved it. Uh, the three ringleaders would be sentenced first in Tampa. They would then be sentenced in North Carolina, and we'd be recommended a concurrent sentence for, for them for anything. But they didn't want Kalish to cooperate. They wanted Kalish to be thrown under the bus, get 30 years in jail, and never be seen or heard from again. And Kalish had good lawyers, and his lawyers were saying, Kalish can give you Manuel Noriega. And Tampa said, we don't want to hear from it. So I had Kalish arraigned and brought to uh, North Carolina. And um, we went out to Camp Lejeune, to Onslow Beach area, where there's some recreational trailers and, uh, that are out there. And we used those as temporary office space. And the, the colonel, who's the provost marshal, was a good old Duplin County boy. And I said, Billy, uh, his name was Billy Summerlin. I said, Billy, I need some security out there. Well, I had boats in the waterway. I had boats in the ocean. I had uh, uh, roving patrol going around us. There, there were guards on the Onslow uh, Beach, the bridge that goes over to the beach. So we had lots of security, because nobody's going to get Kalish off that base without going through all these marine uh, Marine MPs, and we used the, t the two trailers. Now, in the book, uh, what happened was I told Kalish, and Denise was now his fiance. I said, I'm going to give you about an hour and a half while we go to lunch. The lawyers are all going to go to lunch, and um, they have brought lunch in for you guys, and, and there's some you can have, and they left some sandwiches with them. I said, you need to talk over with each other as to whether Kalish wants to cooperate with the government under the terms that I'm offering or not. And I need an answer when I come back in an hour and a half. When well, the book it says their clothes hit the ground before the door was shut uh, on the trailer, so I'm accused of getting Kalish's cooperation through a conjugal visit. But I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. <laughs> but Denise, Denise was very, very attractive. I mean, I can must, must admit she was a very, very attractive lady. And uh, in any event, when Kalish came back, I said, but Kalish has to talk. He has to tell us what's going on, not the lawyers. And I said, you've made your proffer, but this is the time for him to come through with what he says and to show me the corroborative information that you have about, about uh, Noriega. And we, we debriefed him that day. And the debriefing took hours. And I had an agent from Customs. I had an agent from DEA and an agent from the FBI. And each one of those agents wrote up their own separate report and it went up to their headquarters. And when it got up to the headquarters, unbeknownst to me, that created a firestorm. Because now the rent <laughs> was not going to be paid anymore, and this was going to be an issue that went to the national T telephone call from Washington. They said, come to D.C., be here by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. OK. So I flew up to D.C. I came to the, the uh, Justice Department and um, went down to a conference room, and there were my friends from Tampa. And they were in the conference room, and I, this was a rather tense moment. Some coffee in there, Washington Post newspaper, New York Times newspaper, and, and us. 
And so we sat there looking at each other, no, not knowing and not being told anything about why we were there or what was up. We didn't know if we were in trouble or what was up. But um, later the Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division came in and he said, well, it went to the National Security Council today, the meeting is over. And Reagan said, well, if he's in dirty, indict him. And so the indictment of Manuel Noriega took place. And Kalish was one of the principal witnesses against him. And um, we all know that Noriega was ultimately convicted. And uh, after the invasion took place, uh, after the indictment, you may recall that what happened, he was not immediately, uh, the invasion did not take place immediately. It took about a year for that to take place. The indictment was in um, 88. And in, it was February of 89 when finally things came to a head under George Herbert Walker Bush as the president. And the um, Cubans and the Panamanians got to be more provocative together. And there were incidents that took place. Um, one of them was in the tank farm and Marine guards were accused of being trigger happy until it was proven that there were Cuban saboteurs sneaking around in there that the Marines were shooting at. Eventually, one of Noriega's uh, secret policemen executed a naval lieutenant in front of his family by making him kneel in the Straits of Panama City and shooting him in the back of the head. And when that happened, George, George Bush I sent in the cavalry and, and the invasion took place. But that was like a year later uh, when all that happened. But at the time that the decision was made, it was always decided that Panama, the case rather, would be tried in Miami, not in Tampa. And of course, I couldn't have tried it because I really didn't have anything in there, but that we had to get all of our information together and give it to the, the Miami uh, trial team. Uh, there were some questions that remained, uh, as, as we said before, but one of the things that uh, in the book, I put this uh, testimony, which is actually an appendix to the book. That was a hearing before the government committee on, uh, by the Senate on the governmental affairs, the committee on government affairs and investigations. And they actually had Kalish testify. And I put it in the book for two reasons. Uh, first of all, if you've read the book, then you read his testimony, you'll see everything that's in the book is true. Um, it helps uh, buttress the truth of what you've just read. Even though I have a bibliography that tells you where the information came from, uh, this is a much more direct way of doing it. The other thing, it gives you a little bit of a clue about the charming personality that Kalish had, because at the beginning of the uh, testimony, the senator who was in charge of the hearing was, uh, Mr. Kalish, uh, we understand you're a drug smuggler and you've been in drugs ever since you were 16 years old in high school and you've done this and you've done that and you were convicted and you absconded and then you didn't surrender when you were first convicted and you fled and now you've got guilty pleas down in North Carolina and Tampa and it's just about his criminal history and it's, you could tell the tone was not pleasant. It wasn't friendly. And Kalish testifies, he's answering their questions, and this goes on for about two and a half hours. So at the end, one of the senators uh, turned to him and said, Mr. Kalish, is there anything you'd like to tell the youth of America? And so <laughs> something happened in that hearing. I've been around trials and courts just about all my life. Tommy has too. And when you hear somebody set up a softball question like that to a witness that they started off with a very, very harsh demeanor, you know that that witness has got those people in his hands. And, um, and, and that was pretty much Kalish's, um, Kalish's ability to, to charm as well, and, um, as well as to tell you about uh, what you heard being true. Now, as you might guess, this is a pretty exciting story and some people heard about it and now it has been optioned for a movie um, and the people who have optioned it took two and a half years to write a script that everybody can finally like, and it took me three years to write the book. So, because <laughs> uh, I had a day job and I couldn't give up my day job, they're supposedly working on the script and it took them two and a half to three years to do that. Um, it has now gotten to the point where this book is not a self-published book, although I started off self-published, I now am published and have an author, so I moved out of the two to three million people who've published their own book to 65,000 people who are in books in print, and you can go to Barnes and Nobles or Amazon and, and order the book. So that's a huge step, even though it's not, you know, my sales are not enough to quit my day job either. <laughs> <laughs> but it has been optioned for a movie, and they had a, a meeting with Fox last week, and um, they're now in the process of selecting a director 
who will do that, and they have made a deal for international distribution, and they have decided on the location of where they're going to shoot uh, much of the movie, and it'll be shot in uh, Puerto Rico because of tax credits. And the um, uh, tax credits drive a lot of the movies today. If you go to the movies, you'll see the Georgia Peach or the South Carolina Palmetto at the end of the movie, and it always says, this movie created X number of jobs. The last one I saw it was how many? 65,000 jobs was, were created by this movie. We saw it was filmed in Georgia and South Carolina, uh, both of which have an extensive tax credit uh, system in, in, in place. In fact, South Carolina copied the one that North Carolina let expire. Because I'm always asked, why don't they come to Beaufort and film you know, on the Beaufort waterfront? It hadn't changed that much and it looked very similar. I said, yeah, I'd love that too, but the tax credits uh, will, not, will not allow them to do that. And um, so I'm hoping that it's going to be made into a movie here and within the next year. Um, and once the director's in place and gets the actors in place, it all kind of moves very fast. It's very slow to that point and then very fast after that. And they actually film a lot of these movies in six to seven weeks. They just work, 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 work and put everything in. And then they do the post-production. They have lots and lots of shots and then they take the best ones. But it, supposedly the movie's going to start with the invasion of Panama and then tell the story in a flashback as to, well, how did we get to Panama and how did Noriega... So this is really an untold part of American history. Uh, most people don't know how Noriega went from our friend who was supplying information about Castro and the next thing, he was not our friend and he was our enemy. In fact, I was on active duty, brought on active duty as a reservist in Norfolk shortly before the invasion took place because the generals and admirals didn't know. And they wanted, and my uh, staff counterintelligence officer, at that point I was the uh, deputy G2 for Mar 4 Lant headquarters in, uh, as a reservist in, um, in Norfolk, and I was brought in to brief the generals. And this was, now I've got a PowerPoint. Uh, back then, I had a transparency. <laughs> Reminds you of, uh, you know, the little booklet about uh, in, in the olden days where Mama's seatbelt was her arm out, you know. <laughs> Same, the same kind of thing. I briefed the generals. I had a transparency, and I thought I was like cutting edge on telling, <laughs> telling them the story. And I had some, some of the same pictures, but um, it's a lot better on the PowerPoint. <laughs> so I um, always knew this was going to be a great story, and I uh, tried writing a screenplay wh while I was actually still working for the Justice Department. And I kept the discovery materials that we'd give the attorneys so I could document it at, at some point. And um, I realized I don't know how to write a screenplay. That's really hard. That's really difficult. And I just chunked it into a box. Well, uh, Luch and I have been together 14 years and married 13, so it's a later marriage for both of us. We're merging those households, and she finds the box. I said, McCullough, what's this? And uh, I explained it to her, and she said, you know, after looking at it, she said, well, why don't you just take the scenes that you envisioned in your your head and when you're trying to write the screenplay and convert them to chapters. Ah, so uh, the light bulb went off and, and that's what I did. And, and I, I got a person to help me and we put out the timeline and he got to see the reports and then he would write some and I would write some and we told the story mainly from dialogue instead of the way most stories are taught. So I entered it in a competition in Carteret County with the Carteret Writers Association as a true story. And they sent it back rejected. They said, this is fiction. You should have entered it in the wrong category. I said, no, no, it's a true story. <laughs> so people read it and they, they think it's like uh, a, a mystery novel or you know, something of that nature. It, it doesn't read like most true stories, you know, hard, which are hard to plow through. So we've had guys who work on the water in Carteret County that don't read a book a year, according to their wives, who've read my book in a day or two. And they might be interested because they knew some of the people involved in it, but I also think it, we get enough testimonials from people who don't uh, work on the water in Carteret County and don't know any, anybody that uh, had a New Jersey police detective read it and said it's one of the best crime stories he's ever read. So we, th we think it's, it's got a, uh, a great story, and we hope some of you like it because we can conduct a commercial transaction after this is over, <laughs> if some, some of you do. I like to open it up for questions at this point. I usually leave something out, and, and I, got, I, got the, I, I got it that he was a man you could rent. What did I leave out now? Do you want to tell us why they're doing the 
Oh, yes. What are, what, after prison, what does life hold for you? Uh, Stephen Kalish, uh, these guys, uh, the, the ringleaders got sentenced to 14 years, and they served a little over eight uh, because there was parole back then. And, um, and they were, you know, clean, living, cooperating guys, didn't get in trouble in prison, so they didn't do, do anything extra uh, because of bad behavior. So they got paroled after about eight and a half years. Kalish went into the computer business. I told you he liked computers. He went into, uh, lived in Santa Monica, and he developed the e-card that you use today, and he sold that out for $30 million uh, several years ago, $5 million a year for six years, plus a little percentage of every e-card for the life of that patent, which is, I don't know, 28 years, renewable for another 28 years. And he lives on a horse farm in uh, Hawaii with his second wife. Then, um, but you wouldn't want to be Stephen Kalish with all his money, I promise you. He couldn't do what you and I have just done tonight if you ate before you came because he was in the hospital in California and he got infected with that flesh-eating disease that you've probably read about that gets in a lot of hospitals have trouble in combating the infections. And this flesh-eating uh, disease took off his epiglottis and ate it. So he has to keep a constant spitty cup with him and spit out his own saliva and can't take any liquid or food into uh, his body and feeds himself through a, through a tube that is inserted or a pack that's inserted into his uh, abdomen. I, for one, would not want to live like that. Even if I had $30 million, I wouldn't trade that off. But that's what he's doing. Uh, Lee Rich went back to the Grand Caymans. His family owned one of the beaches on the seven uh, hotels on the Seven Mile Beach. Done some building and development of uh, some condos and projects down there. But they say that most of those projects are built with drug money laundered out of Columbia. So he maintained his ties with his Colombians and became a successful builder and developer. And he had hidden partners who then could clean up their, their profits. Uh, and he still lives down there and is still alive. Um, Michael Vogel uh, was a bit of a thug from Detroit, as you might have picked up from the fact that he had somebody shot, uh, that he was not in the same league as an international playboy or Kalish who could charm you and fly heads of state around in a, in a jet plane. Michael Vogel became a sex toy salesman, and that's what he does in Detroit. And I can't make that up, that's obvi obviously. So uh, that's what the, the three ringleaders uh, did. Now, in my prosecution of North Carolinians uh, in that particular case, we had the mayor of Atlantic Beach, uh, was one of the persons prosecuted. Uh, he uh, had a critical role in that these smugglers um, wanted an offload site that was very clandestine, and it was on Weyerhaeuser property. The mayor of Atlantic Beach was Gary Walters at the time, and Gary had the keys to the gates that are on the Weyerhaeuser property because he was the custodian for a hunt club that rented hunting rights from Weyerhaeuser Corporation. They had a little uh, hunt club building. Uh, out there, and then to get there on the weekends that they wanted a hunting, Gary would go and hit unlock the gates and open the gates so they could get into the property. And then after the weekend was over, he'd put the gates back in place and, and the gates stayed locked up. So you couldn't just go riding around cruising through Weyerhaeuser property. Well, he un unlocked the gates. They brought the truck in that was going to uh, be for the offload of the marijuana. And it was driven by a Teamster driver from a Teamster union in Pittsburgh. And they actually would buy shrimp, get a manifest for shrimp, and they would put shrimp in the very back of the truck, and they would put the pot up front. And in those days, there were very few canines on the interstates. And so if you went through your weight control stations and you were good on your weight, you show them a manifest, it's not uncommon for a Teamster driver to come to North Carolina, pick up seafood, and haul it back to the north. And so it all looked very, very legitimate. That's why they were so keen on knowing where the cops were at any particular time, because their only vulnerability would be late at night, 4 a.m., and come out of the woods on Weyerhaeuser property and turn onto a road. Once they made that turn onto the road and got onto Highway 70, they were pretty well good for the, for the rest of the trip. That was their big vulnerability, because if a deputy sheriff had come by and seen a tractor trailer coming out of the Weyerhaeuser property at 4 o'clock, he would have probably pulled that vehicle to see what was going on. But um, that's one of the things that they had was really high security on that particular 
uh, situation and um, in November they were obviously very successful using that modus operandi. But I prosecuted him, uh, Bobby Webb who is a sport a trainer at the sports center, uh, a guy named John Van Horn who owned uh, later on he, he owned the uh, uh, Ice House restaurant in downtown Moorhead City which is now Sammy's if any of you go down there and have Sammy's Raw Bar. Uh, that was the building he, he had. <coughs> and John Van Horn would put boats in the water for the guys who were going out fishing and he would move the boats around from, from marina to marina. And so that was one of the reasons that I had people that I wanted to prosecute that Tampa didn't. I saw a hand back here. Uh, my, my question is too, really, did them housing the money in uh, Moriega's country, were you able to get to that? and confiscate that, and also what was a thousand pounds of marijuana worth? What was the street value when you say 29,000 pounds? The 29, well, the a thousand, let's put it this way, a pound of marijuana would probably be worth three to five hundred dollars in street value. Uh, but these were at wholesale prices and so they were a little bit less than that, maybe $250 to $300 back then. But it would still run millions of dollars for the people at the top. The pay scale was $10,000 for uh, a bail humper, $25,000 for a truck driver, $25,000 for a crew member, $35 to $50,000 for the boat captain. Um, offload guys and security guys were probably $15,000 each. And then after that, it was all profit for the top. So the three guys would split up the money and they would make several million dollars each on each trip. And I don't remember the exact prices but that gives you a, a rough framework. And that's how they ended up with 50 million dollars which would be worth buying power today. You got to remember it was 1982 buying power and what, what could you buy with that kind of money. Ten thousand dollars would be like having a hundred today. So I've told the story. That's it. Everybody's ready for a commercial transaction. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. I've looked at your list of speakers. And so, questions that you have? I do have one question. I read your book today, which tells you I didn't do anything else. <laughs> but, um, my first thing was, like you said, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it was just amazing reading it. Was there ever any inclination or suspicion that Denise was not all she well, Denise eventually learned what Kalish's role was, and he, he didn't con he convinced her for a little while that he was really an international banker. But then, after a while, she would see things, and he confided in her and told her, "Yes, but he'll get out of the business." And so she was willing to wait for him. And you got to remember back back then, and maybe even today, there's a lot of people who don't think running drugs is all that bad. Uh, as a bad, as evil. They, they don't see the collateral consequences for it. And Kalish was always one to say, oh, I, I'm not violent. We, we don't, he, he would tell her, and in fact, even today, he'll tell you that if he were here, we were making a presentation, he would call himself a gentleman smuggler. And he would say that my people didn't use guns. Well, there was a shotgun on the Lady Marset because it cocked a ground when the Coast Guard was on there, there was a 357 in the boat because we got it with, the, with their driver's license. You know, the guards who were on the guard boats, they all had guns. They had shotguns with them. Uh, so if anybody had been curious, there would have been some gunplay of some type by, by his folks. So that is uh, either amnesia or uh, a, story that, uh, a story that he would tell. But his, you can't be in the drug business and be totally unarmed. You know, somebody's going to come and take it from you, either the drugs or the money. We always heard the rumor that there was a lot coming into Sneed's Ferry. Oh, <laughs> my wife and I were just talking about that. Sneed's Ferry, uh, this was only one of many drug smuggling organizations we had in eastern North Carolina that we prosecuted. This one was unique in that it resulted in this um, invasion of a sovereign nation and the arrest of a uh, head of state. But in Sneed's Ferry, the big case that we had in Sneed's Ferry was in um, February, March, kind of like this. It's a warm day, kind of like today. And the boat came in and it pushed right up on the shore. 
and they were unloading the, the bales of marijuana. Well, just about at that time, about, just about every white male over 21 was at the boat unloading. They had two Onslow County deputy sheriffs there in their car who were going to lead the, the truck that it was being loaded with marijuana to a tobacco warehouse in Newburn for an overnight stay before they pushed north. And the wives of the guys who were, or their girlfriends, of the, the guys who were doing the unloading were down at the water. So they had some with little kids who were playing in the water while daddy unloaded the product, whatever the product was. It's wrapped up in burlap. And um, a few years later, two Department of Correction buses pulled up to the Onslow County Courthouse and took just about every one of those guys off to prison. Uh, so, bed of smuggling. Brunswick County was a big hotbed of smuggling. Uh, we sent the sheriff of Brunswick County to jail back in the day. Herman Strong was his name. Some of you may re recall that. Uh, some of you are not old enough to have been born when this happened, but others will, will remember some, some of these things. Um, Herman Strong would have his deputies on the opposite side of the county on the night that he knew that a smuggling load was come in, and then he would get paid $50,000 for making sure that they they came in unmolested. Um, and we had other cases that went into uh, to Brunswick County. One of them cost the U.S. attorney at the, the time his job because one of his buddies was an informant, and the informant tried to keep who was the U.S. attorney at the time in the 80s, um, or in the 70s, rather, late 70s, early 1980, 79, 80 time frame. He didn't want to prosecute his buddy because he had been taking his girl Brunswick County and having, um, he was married, but he had a girlfriend, and he was having his girlfriend shack up with him down at his buddy's condo at um, Holden Beach. And so when all that came out, the Department of Justice said, you're fired or you can resign, and he resigned. But um, so, yeah, we had lot, lots of those cases. We had one that we were talking about in Hyde County where the uh, highway patrolman comes into the Holiday Inn at sits at the intersection of 64 and 17. He'd have coffee or have a sandwich or whatever, and he's talking to the maid, and he says, how's the driving crazy? They go out all day, <laughs> and they take that big truck out back, and then they come back at night and order pizza. I know that room is going to be a wreck. And so they surveilled them to a fish house in Hyde County. And uh, the next one or two nights later, the boat came in and they busted them all in, uh, in, the, in the act of unloading. And uh, everybody went, went to prison. And there was a little street, dust, a dirt lane really, that ran down to the fish house. And it had a, uh, the name of that lane was Fifth Avenue. So that was the Fifth Avenue case. And so... <laughs> Uh, we had another one at Oregon Inlet, and we're debriefing one of the smugglers and said, well, we, we were going to come in on this night, but we had to loiter offshore one more day. He said, well, why? He said, well, we came in toward the Oregon Inlet Fishing Center, and there's somebody else in there unloading. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know we, we, had, we had lots of them. I could pick a lot of them and, and, and write a good little short story, and maybe a, a good book would be a series of short stories that would be mainly for North Carolina consumption about all the different cases that we, we had. Um, a deputy sheriff and an SBI agent were riding around uh, offload sites in Pamlico County, ones that, they, that we thought might be used as offload sites. And they came in, and lo and behold, there's, a, there's an offload going on. And so they grabbed two or three guys and arrest them. But um, the guy who was in charge of that particular group was the NCOIC of the Coast Guard Station at Hoboken. And so, you know, uh, and he had decided to go, go south. So we had a, a large number of groups that were, were coming in, and, and that doesn't even, uh, and some of them were prosecuted by Mike Easley when he was the district attorney down in Brunswick County. Some of them were prosecuted by the Special Prosecution Unit for the Attorney General's Office. Um, one of the prosecutors there was Don Stevens, who is the Chief Resident Superior Court Judge in Raleigh today and who was my replacement at Naval Justice School in Newport, Rhode Island when I was on active duty in the Marine Corps and getting ready to leave active duty and he came in to replace me. So uh, we've had lots of them, even though we were not as busy as say Florida was, we had our fair share. And then it switched to cocaine smuggling by air. How are we, how are we doing today? Today, 
you don't, uh, the smuggling doesn't take place by, in large measure by boat. You might have somebody who went to the island, bought a key of cocaine and smuggles it back or a couple of keys, but you don't have the large scale smuggling that would be of the, particularly of marijuana, that would, which would be really hard to unload. For the reason I said at the beginning, you're never out of, out of sight of a house and this takes hours to do. Now, if somebody could go and have five keys of, of cocaine, they could put it in a cooler and take it off the boat and put it in their car, and we wouldn't know, but it's, it wouldn't be a, you know, large-scale smuggling. That's, that's the difference. Uh, people who have the job that I had back then, now they take them to the border and orient them to the border, and usually take them to a, among other places, take them to one of the crossings where there's going to be 65 to 100,000 cars coming through today, and there's 15 or 20 stations across that those vehicles are going to have to pass through and try to figure out which ones are carrying drugs and which ones are not. And that's, that's where a lot of the bulk smuggling comes through is just in vehicles that are coming across in which the drugs are clandestine or by coming across the border uh, through tunnels. Although there's some that's being carried by backpack, it takes a lot of people to carry drugs by backpack to get a large number of drugs in the country. Any other questions? What happened to Denise? Where is she? Oh, yeah, that's a good... <laughs> ...for about seven years of his eight years, eight, eight and a half years in prison. But Kalish was in um, Terminal Island uh, Federal Correctional Institution, which is in San Diego. And she met a lawyer from San Diego, and uh, the lawyer from San Diego and her ended up, she divorced Kalish and married the lawyer. Now, I don't know how long that marriage lasted, but she stayed with Kayla for seven and a half years while he was in prison. I don't think the lawyer ever went to prison, so I reckon she stayed with him. <laughs> Can you just real quick tell them how uh, uh, he met Denise that night? Oh, he met her, and he met her, I think I told him, he met her in a nightclub. And he, and <laughs> he sent her a bottle of champagne, and then he told her, don't you want, do you want to fly to the Grand Caymans? And she thought, sure. The waiter, the waiter sent the bottle over. The waiters wouldn't wait on... Oh, that was after when he came up to D.C. to testify to that Senate committee. Her lawyer, to give you an idea of how pretty she was, her lawyers took her out to dinner that night before the Kalish testified before the Senate the next day. And they're in a Georgetown Italian restaurant and the manager came over and said, are you guys leaving yet? And they said, well, we're on our coffee after dinner, and yeah, we'll, we'll be finished shortly. He said, well, good. My waiters won't wait on any other table but this one, and my other <laughs> patrons are getting a little antsy. <laughs> so they all wanted to buzz around her. So that's, that's true. That gives you a good idea of how attractive she was. Thanks for asking that question. <laughs>